Netflix is remaking another childhood classic, which, as you know, has always turned out well. Please, I just want to kill her a little bit. Except sometimes, miraculously, it does work. She-Ra is good, Voltron mostly, lost in spaces, apparently. Being a remake or a continuation or a reboot of these classic characters, I mean even being a live action adaptation of an anime or cartoon series doesn't mean that it will be bad. Sure doesn't help though. <laughs> I, and shoot me for saying this, really enjoyed Alita Battle Angel, and Scooby-Doo, and Detective Pikachu, and now, Netflix is looking to remake Avatar The Last Airbender. In live action. Ah! Since it was first announced, we have had some concept art of Aang and Appa, we've had a full casting list almost, and we've had some hints at the things that they might be changing for the series. To which you're going, changes? To Avatar? What sins might they commit? The reality is, a lot of the changes are going to stem from the structure of the Netflix show. Netflix is taking 20 half-hour episodes and adapting them into 10 one-hour episodes. It is literally the same runtime as the series, and if they wanted, they could do a shot-for-shot -shot remake. But they won't. There is an opportunity to reimagine a story that had originally been told in self-contained half-hour episodes as an ongoing serialized narrative. That means story points and emotional arcs we had loved in the original could be given more room to breathe and grow. But it's bigger than that. The way in which we consume Netflix shows, devouring them like voracious gremlins after midnight, has changed how we write television. It's no longer dependent on reruns that stand on their own like the Great Divide over and over and over again whenever I happen to catch the show Nickelodeon, or weekly episodes at exactly the same time and if you're not there or you forget to tape it then it's gone forever. <laughs> Television is so much more flexible now and the money that it generates through subscriptions also means that it doesn't have to cater to as wide an audience. It can be a lot more niche and that's why we've had a lot more experimental shows in the last five years or so. Episodic storytelling caters to that more casual viewer and has these limitations, with every episode needing to be self-contained to some degree. And so, in this new format, on Netflix, we're gonna be seeing what Avatar would be like in this new media landscape. So yeah, we have the same runtime to play with, but we're not just gonna get the Southern Air Temple and the Kyoshi Warriors glued together in one episode. For example, there's been some implication that the Kyoshi Island storyline might be extended, because Kyoshi has already been cast, alongside Suki and her mum and her sister, neither of whom were big characters in the original show. They might do something like, you know, the Southern Air Temple is on Kyoshi Island, and Suki goes with the gang to it as they learn about the Air Nomad genocide, extending out this kind of setting that they're playing with. The writers might be thinking that this gives time to develop her and Sokka's relationship, or Sokka's growth as a character, or give more time to explore the ramifications of the Air Nomad genocide. I mean, I know a lot of people have said that in Season 3 they wish they could have seen Zuko with the gang more after he turned to their side, which they could do. I'm not saying that these things are going to happen, but that these are the sort of changes that they are going to make. Of course, this is a very different question from... Will it be good? I don't know! These are changes to the story, and part of me is going, okay, fine, yeah, you can do that, but it's still fine as it is, leave it alone. But I'm gonna try and keep an open mind. I mean, the show isn't flawless. Is he allowed to say that? Legally? But let's take some guesses at the things that they might minimize and the things that they might expand on in the Netflix show. And you tell me what you think they might change or you definitely don't want them to change down in the comments below. Looking at season one, my bet is they're gonna minimize episodes like The Great Divide, The Fortune Teller, Battle and the Water Tribe, maybe The Northern Air Temple, in favor of the storylines in The Kyoshia Warriors, Jet, The Blue Spirit, and Imprisoned. The former episodes tend to develop their characters and series and themes a little bit less, while the latter episodes tend to have quite a long lasting impact on the series itself. So if I had to pick, it'd be those. If you had to see changes, what would you want to see and what do you definitely not want them to change or what do you want them to keep? There is one challenge that they're gonna face with this, which is that unfortunately, Sokka tends to get the episodes that are less important for the series. 
We also know that Azula, May, and Ty Lee are going to appear more in Season 1. Now, everyone knows Azula has always been the stronger villain than Ozai in the series, but I'm not quite sure what role she really has in Season 1. You know, the Zuko pursuing the Avatar dynamic is a really tight uh, kind of like storyline, and maybe she's going to be a secondary antagonist, maybe she'll only appear in flashbacks, that'd be my preference, is that there's more background to Zuko. Uh, in the first series, we'll see. But there is another big change, another big challenge, and that is medium. This is live action, it's not animation, and they have entirely different visual languages. Part of the reason that anime and cartoons are so hard to adapt to live action is that the medium is part of the story, it's part of the delivery, how we experience the story, and I don't know how much of that will translate from the original series to this live action version. On the one hand, with the budget and technology that the show is going to have, they're going to be able to do fancier stuff and cooler bending, which by the way, the creators have always talked about wanting to do, but they couldn't at the time just with the budget constraints they had. But on the other? Can you imagine Attack on Titan without its distinct animation style? It's just hard to imagine, right? Oh yeah, that, that, that happened. How will they adapt, say, the visual comedy or the vivid color scheme of the series? It looks really good in animation, looks pretty cheap in live action. The shift in medium for these kinds of stories means that things will feel different visually and tonally. And for a lot of people, that's just gonna be too much. And I get that. Because you'll probably know the Avatar community has something of a traumatic backstory with live action adaptations. Ah! I ran away before they trained me to be the Avatar. I don't know how to bend the other elements. So yes, I am wary of it. But please do keep in mind that He Who Must Not Be Named's film was bad, not necessarily because it was in the live action medium itself, but because of the writing and directing and acting. And I just want to apologize uh, for um, showing you those clips. I realized that uh, for a lot of people, uh, those are really traumatic and I take full responsibility for my actions. Um, I'm gonna be taking a break. No. <laughs> I've never done anything like this before. But all of these things, the writing, directing, acting, could be amazing with the right people. And I will say this for the Netflix series so far. They seem to have the right people. Listen to me. I mean, Paul Sun Hyung Lee as Iroh. Have you ever seen anyone more Iroh looking? Gya Wondi Otabel as Katara? I mean, she looks perfect. Or Dallas Liu as Zuko? That's such a hot casting choice, it's gonna burn half my face off. Maria Zhang as Suki. Love it. We all know that Asian culture is the bedrock of Avatar's world building, and the casting should absolutely reflect that, and I am stoked that so far, that seems to be the case. Instead of, uh, you know. Ah! Now, if there is one thing that we know about Netflix is that they are notoriously hit or miss. Sometimes they give us Arcane, and other times it's Fate the Wink Saga. Either way, Netflix seems to be pretty hands off with their creatives, and I am glad because I've seen way too many shows and films screwed over by executive interference. So, from my perspective, this is a good thing. But, at the same time, the overwhelming impression from Avatar fans is... Why? Why does this need to be made? Why is this a thing at all? And for the answer to that question, I say we ask the Oracle, Momo. Why is this series being made? Money. I mean, the head writer of the Netflix series even said the same thing, and none of this is made easier by the fact that Mike and Brian, the creators of the original series, walked away and sort of publicly denounced the project. <laughs> Netflix made a very public promise to support our vision. Unfortunately, there was no follow through on that promise. It was a negative and unsupportive environment. As long as we felt those ideas were in line with the spirit and integrity of Avatar, we would have happily embraced them. But we were not able to meaningfully guide the direction of the story. Which is pretty damning, gotta admit. Uh, but, Two things. One, TV productions are complicated, all right? There is so much stuff that goes on behind the scenes and doesn't get stated or shared. 
And it's easy to speculate about exactly what went on that made them leave, but more than likely, it was a myriad of reasons that led them to do that, personal and professional, and not all of them are gonna mean that Netflix is screwing over the series and destroying it. You know, people said it was because they were whitewashing the cast, but clearly that's not the case. And two, Mike and Brian are not the be all and end all of Avatar. Aaron and Elizabeth Haas were cornerstone writers for the series, they pushed for Zuko's character arc, and they wrote a lot of the most iconic episodes. None of these people are involved, but they are not the only gifted writers in the world, okay? So yes, it is a nail in the coffin, but it is not the final nail. But the big question is, what can we hope for? Genuinely, what can we expect out of the series and hope for out of the series? What's the bar that we should be setting for it? And I spoke about this in my video on the uh, uh, film that shall not be named. Ah! That there are tons of moments in that film that were perfectly replicated from the show and they make you go, ha, I recognize that. But they don't have the context around those moments that make those beats meaningful. I don't want Netflix to just replicate Avatar for me, or replicate moments from Avatar for me. I wanted to understand the storylines that made it a powerful story. You know, I want to see Aang struggle with the genocide of his people, I want to see Sokka wrestling with living up to his father, and Katara's motherliness coming from trauma. They are gonna change some things, I can accept that. But I'm going to be looking for changes that make the pacing and delivery of these themes and arcs more meaningful in the medium and package that we are getting it in. I don't want a replica, but I want them to respect the story. I can understand them expanding, say, Jet's storyline, but I wouldn't want them to just introduce a new storyline or a new character. That to me just doesn't vibe. So is there any hope for this series? Yes. Yes, I think there kind of is, okay? Uh, but it's kind of like returning to a relationship that hasn't worked out before. You're giving it another shot, but you're not sure how much hope is there. So I will end this video with a quote from the head writer of the Netflix series that gives me hope. And I wanted to give you hope. I don't want to modernize the story or twist it to fit current trends. Throughout this process, our byword has been authenticity to the story, to the characters, to the cultural influences. And you know what? I can live with that. But we'll see. Tell me down below what you'd be happy with them changing, what you definitely do not want them to change at all. Stay nerdy, and I'll see you in the future.